Hi, everyone. Welcome to this Fain online event. I'm uh, Itamar Sulovic from Honey & Co. Uh, so lucky to be here with talking with one of my favorite people ever, Georgina Hayden. Hi. Um, hi. Hi. Hey, darling. Hi. How are you? I'm really good. How are you? I'm super good. I cannot be happier talking to you. I know that, you know, we said they asked us to, to keep it to an hour, but I know that me and Georgie <laughs> can just chew the fat for days and days. I, I think they're going to struggle to edit this down, my love. Yeah. But yeah, I'm so happy yeah, to be talking gonna, to we're you. We're going to give them some uh, work to do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, likewise, when I found out it was you, I was like, yes, it's all the best. So this is like, this is just us having a nice chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't believe that this is my job. <laughs> Same. And it's it's a, a doubly happy occasion because we have every time you know a new Georgina Hayden book is always a cause for celebration. This one I have to say is is in itself a celebration. It's just oh, I mean I can say I don't want to insult the other book, but I think it's just <laughs> the best one. <laughs> Do you know it's okay really funny. I don't know. I know it's weird, isn't it? Because I feel like my books have got, you know, they got deep and deeper and deeper and then and then this one is almost, yeah, I don't know. I feel like I don't want to like run ahead because I know you've got questions and stuff. But I feel like I found my voice a lot in this yeah. one. So and, I, I can say yeah. that, you know, I feel, you know, that this is kind of like the most you. Yeah. Uh, but let's, 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 yeah. let's not go there quite yet. <laughs> um, Slow down. Let's tell me, because this is something, this is just, I realized that I don't really know. So. How did you get to this world of, of recipe writing, of, you know, sort of food, meat, yeah. I guess? I don't know. What, what's what's your job? What's our job? What is this? What's, what do we do? Um, do, we do? Well, uh, how did it start? So, you know, I'm sure I'm probably saying things like, you know, you might know already or people know already, but my family had a restaurant. So my um, my mum's parents had a deli um, in they moved over from Cyprus, all my family from Cyprus, and they were one of the first families in you know, they had a shop where they would import loads of Cypriot produce in the 60s and 70s. And then my dad's family had a Greek Cypriot restaurant. They had a taverna called Dilanda. So both sides of my family were super, super foodie. Um, and, you know, my grandparents lived above the restaurant and our life revolved around this taverna. So the first sort of 13 years of my life, that's all I knew. Everything was in this restaurant. And I still got my... Um, all my grandparents until I was an adult and I, my yeah yeah my granny who had the restaurant is still alive so she's like my main muse everything I do is sort of run past her um, and it kind of started there and it sounds super basic and naive to say but I think food was so ingrained in our life that I didn't realize how obsessed with food I was because I just assumed that was normal you know so um when I was 18, I had a farmer's market stall in North London. Again, the penny didn't drop. I was told I was very academic at school, so I should go to uni and all that stuff. So I actually did fine art and history of art, which I loved. And especially but... sort of uh, food families, they don't want the kids to, to yeah. go into food. Yeah, it's so especially true. Like restaurants. I, yeah, I went to a, a dinner last night, actually, um, at Nopi, and they've got this new head chef, Elaine, and she was saying like her dad didn't want her to you know, go into, it's that thing, isn't it? Like, and especially because my family, like, you know, I never saw my dad and, you know, my grandparents. And that was, you know, it's hard, you know, owning restaurants and running restaurants is hard, right? So um, it wasn't encouraged. And, you know, I was the first person on both sides of my family to leave home to go to uni, you know, like it was a big deal. So wow. uni was fun and I love art, but um, it, it was when I was at uni that I realised actually I was obsessed with food and, you know, it taken me that long to figure it out. And it was when I was in my last year at uni and I'm doing this art degree and I'm obsessed with food and everyone else is reading Cosmo and I'm sitting there reading Delicious Mag and Donna Hay and Delicious had just come to the UK. So I wrote to them on a whim and I was like, can I come and do work experience? And they said, yeah, come in. You know, I mean, nowadays it's probably like a wait list or something. And I went to this really new magazine and I thought they were going to put me in the design department because I'm arty. And I went on a photo shoot and I just had this proper epiphany moment. I met a food stylist and there was this person whose job it was to cook the food and make the food look beautiful for photography. So I, that to me was like, uh, that's it. That's the job I want to do. I want to be able to cook 
and be creative, but I want it to be like artistic. So it started there basically, long, long story, vaguely short. Um, so I went back to Delicious after I graduated, they got me a runner's job. I was a Christmas elf. I was in charge of like Christmas gifting for Sainsbury's Mag because it was all the same publishing house. And then when I was there, I was on a photo shoot for Sainsbury's Mag. I met Jamie Oliver's head food stylist, a woman called Ginny. And, you know, I don't know how you are in the kitchen, but like basically for Ginny, she, you know, she would have all these people, like these chefs and these people that are trained up coming to her. But on like a food, when you're doing food telly and you're doing 16 hour days and it's complete chaos, basically having someone who's food, you know, food centered, but uses their initiative was more important than skills. And I was on this shoot and I made this birthday cake for someone and she was like, you must come and work with me. So because I just used my noggin and I was like really proactive and, you know, I was even more talkative and energetic then than I am now. It's hard to believe. This, this I will say, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is restaurant upbringing. It's where, yeah, you're right. You wrong. get up and go and you sort things out. You this get is, you know, things, yeah, there's you get no, things done. A hundred percent. Because, I, you know, I remember being there because I ended I'm up glad you agree. Yeah, like I was there for 12 years and occasionally you'd have people come in and they had all the training, say, like, you know, the college formal training, but not so much proper, you know, like being in kitchens. And occasionally they would sit down. And I remember Ginny saying to this one girl going, darling, you never sit down in a kitchen. There is always something to do. And it's that, isn't it? You can't teach that. Yeah. You've got to just live it. And, you know, yeah. so anyway. I, I always feel that like I can grab one of my chefs at random Put them at number 10 and everything yeah. will be fine yes you know what i mean you just yeah. get it done get it done we don't need to over analyze it just do it you know yeah. and yeah so i moved to jamie's and i was part of his food team for 12 years before i went <laughs> solo yeah 12 years so i started off you know food styling and assisting but then ultimately i ended up specializing in more the development side i love recipe development like i love food styling because and that is where you would cook food for photography and television. And I traveled the world with him and, you know, I moved to LA and really, really fun times. But mm. I loved the development side. Like for me, I get so much enjoyment, you know, getting a brief and creating a recipe that I know someone will at home go and recreate and it will be, in, you know, hopefully just as good. And I think there's a real, that's a real, you know, specialist thing to be able to write these books because that's, you know, there are so many cookbooks nowadays and I'm not saying like, you know, I'm the best in the world ever, but it is, I take it very seriously. I take the writing of the recipes, knowing that little things, like if someone's buying an ingredient, not making it a piddly amount, making sure it's like, you know, it's user-friendly and accessible and stuff like that. So really good training there. And then after that, I basically also left Also a off very sort of... Uh... Uh, nurturing environments a lot of yeah. people came up from from you know sort of give give people room to grow and yeah 100 percent. he was like working with jamie as well he was really nurturing and i felt like a lot of opportunities and learned lots and when i you know i, I went part-time and then i left and he's always been super supportive of my career and what i do i wrote my first book whilst i was there actually when i was part-time and you know, I left after I had Persephone, my eldest daughter. I didn't go back. And, you know, it's nerve wracking when you've had a, you know, a PAYE job for 13 years to go solo. But um, it's been brilliant, you know, and I've just written more books and columns and and I love it. I love the variety of it. It was great. Yeah, it is it is um, a fantastic, you know, if this is where you need to be, then yeah. it's, it's fantastic. Yeah, it's lovely. Uh, can we can we talk about the the books? Can you? Yeah. Because, like I said, I, I I you know been a fan for for a long time, and I'm you know following your books, and I I definitely you know I have a theory oh. about about the journey of your books, but you tell it. You know, let's see if, oh, that's if, so interesting. You know. I want to hear the theory. Um, so actually, I would say when I first decided I wanted to write books. Um, Taverna was meant to be my first book okay. so Taverna was the book I always wanted to write and I think if, I, if I'm blessed with writing 10 books or 20 books however many cookbooks I'll never be able to rewrite Taverna that's my story 
that's my family that's got photos of the deli and the restaurant and my grandparents you know and that's how it all started it's dedicated to my grandparents they are you know that's home for me and they my grandmas taught me everything you know so Taverna was always the book that I dreamed of writing and I think in my you know when I realized I wanted to work in food in my early 20s um it, there weren't any Cypriot cool Cypriot cookbooks you know they were still super dated it's like 80s books cup of this cup of that no measurements you know and Tessa Kiros's Falling Cloudberries was the first book I'd ever read that was beautiful but um it had any representation of Cypriot food in, in, a, in a good way, in a cool way. And that was always the dream was to write Taverna. And when I started that journey into writing Taverna, it, it also coincided with me having a, a big personal tragedy. My son died um, and it all happened around the same sort of time as me going part time to write these books. And everything changed after that as it would, you know, something that big and the way I, I sort of, it all changed, the way I cooked changed, everything changed. I didn't, I didn't feel like I could write to Verna at that point. And so I wanted to write a much more, um, a book of that time, which was, I would say, Stir so Stirring Slowly was my first book. And it's a book that goes sort of quietly, like compared to the other books at least, but I'm so proud of it because the recipes, I stand by it, you know, they're lovely recipes, ones I'm really proud of. And the idea, it's sort of mindful cooking, the sort of food that you need, to, you want to cook when you've had a stressful day or something bad is happening or you need some quiet time. And it was, you know, it was cathartic and it was what I needed at that time. And and I, I, I love, so actually I signed a two book deal. So Stirring Slowly, then Taverna. Um, and it's interesting, the, I'm on book four now, and there definitely is a journey. All the books have got this thread through them of family. So you had Stirring Slowly, which was my family at the time, then Taverna, which was my second book, which was all about my upbringing and my heritage. And then my third book is Nastissima, which, quite frankly, why I haven't got a PhD for that blooming book, <laughs> it sent me over the edge, like... I mean, can you imagine? Going I think, I, yeah, I think you should get like a <laughs> Doctor you know, OBE from Greek government. Or Do you something know what like I mean? That. Can yeah, someone completely. in the Greek embassy come and just yeah. give me some sort of like honor or something? They don't. Yeah. They didn't. No one did. No. I mean, I had some, you know, chats with priests and FaceTimes and WhatsApps with various priests and emails. But so, so this is the premise of it is Greek Lenten food. So vegan yeah. food. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine going to a publisher going, I've got this idea, orthodox fasting. I mean, hard sell. What? <laughs> I want to write about this really niche subject matter. I want to write about, anyway. But, you know, it, it was... But to be fair, though, like, what would be Greek fasting is for, for regular people would be like yeah. my wedding. You know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> It's so true. Greeks fasting. I mean, have you heard of the biggest sort of juxtaposition of like words? Yeah, it's it's like, 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 what? There's no meat. I was like, what do you mean there's no meat? There's like 15 no dishes meat. on the table. Yeah, right. There's no meat. We're fasting. No We're fasting. I love it. Yeah. I know people are like, fasting means not eating. I'm like, no, 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 not to Greeks. We still eat. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> there still needs to be an abundance of food. It just has yeah. no animal products. So Nistissima, I, I'm, you know, I'm proud of all of them. Nistissima was a real labour of love. I mean, the the research involved on such a big subject, you can imagine anything that's political or religious is obviously really hard to write about. Um, I, I, worse was that I wrote it, we hit the pandemic and I was pregnant with my baby and I spent most of it writing in my car with sleeping children in the back, I, a laptop at my wheel, obviously parked. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, that book, I've never been so panicky about anything in my life. You know, like you just think, God, what have I done? Was it wrong? Is it wrong? Anyway, people got it. And that was brilliant. So I've been on this it's lovely fantastic. trajectory. It's I also, I have to say, th this is uh, also, there's a strong family link because because yeah. is your, your uncle a priest, no? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so this yeah, is yeah. How it started almost. Yeah, good intel. Yeah, yeah, so my uncle's a priest. And, you know, my grannies were and are just very religious. So fasting has always been a part of my life. Like it was something we were always encouraged to do. And we grew up, you know, I grew up this restaurant that was a grill house me everywhere but we still I grew up eating a lot of lentils a lot of pulses and it's something you just don't question that's just life yeah. you know 
So it always cracks up when people say, how do you get your kids to eat this food? Well, lentils are delicious. And as a kid, that's what we grew up eating. You know, it's brilliant. Yeah. So I loved my tenacissima. And yeah, again, lots of family ties and links. My granny's a big part of it. Um, and then now we're on to Greekish. So book four. And it's a funny one because in a way, it's the it's actually the most like stirring slowly in that the recipes are mine. This is like, this is me there's no taverna was traditional this system is traditional so this is more like stirring slowly they're like everyday recipes they're my recipes and I've had I like I just feel like I've had loads of fun with it I feel like I've grown up and that's not to say my other books aren't wonderful I love them all but and I don't know if it's psychologically like I turned 40 and I'm just like I feel more confident in myself in my writing I ha I feel like I have less to prove as well um I feel like I've done my due diligence in a lot of ways and with this one I just, just want to just, have fun with it just want yeah. to have fun can yeah. I read one bit from the intro I know that <laughs> I'm, I'm that's dead. the most embarrassing thing that can help to you but bear with me okay I'm, oh I'm gonna no be... someone reading your own work to you no is... just one sentence Georgie just one sentence I can't think this, of this was the this was the sort of uh you know, I, I was prone to love this book even before I opened it. A bias. And, but, and, and what I do love about your books and about your writing and about what you do is, is that feeling of there's someone with you in the kitchen and someone who's fun and interested and you can trust. And then I read, I read this line. Oh, God. I want to feed you from a table groaning with food, but I also want to chat to you in a too loud voice while gesticulating a lot. And I was like, yeah, this is what I want. <laughs> This is my this is my perfect Georgina Hayden moment. This is what I want. This is what I've always wanted. This is what this book delivers in in <laughs> such beauty and generosity because it is you do feel like you either you know you're in someone's kitchen and yeah. you know you're being shown the ropes or someone's in the kitchen and they're oh. showing you the ropes and you're having fun and you're having a gas and you're gossiping and you know you're you're talking too loud and you're knocking pans <laughs> because you just took it off. I loved it. I loved it. You know, I, loved I, it. I didn't know what sentence you were going to pick, but I love that you picked that. That is so, and because we have cooked in a kitchen together, like, you know, you and I have spent good time in a kitchen yeah. and it is kind of like looking in the mirror. <laughs> you're the same. Let's be honest. We're exactly the same. We're cooking and we're chatting and there's that hands waving everywhere. Um, but that is just, you know, and would I have written that sentence that confidently 10 years ago? Maybe not. Maybe I wasn't so self-aware or, you know, enough to understand what I was about. And I think partly that's age, partly that's when you're, there's a, you know, I think there's a lot of chat at the moment about second generation and first generation people, you know, coming to this country. And, and I think that, that is partly it as well, you know, like I hilariously out of the grandkids I was the one growing up that really shunned my Cypriotness actually I'm the only grandchild really? that didn't yeah I'm the only one that didn't finish Greek school um I just hated it I just it was so funny like you know my grandparents all knew that I was going to be the one that probably wouldn't marry a Cypriot boy that's a big deal you know and if you're not an Im a child of an immigrant or a second generation you know that's something that people wouldn't necessarily understand but you know for my grandma both my grandmas but particularly the one that's alive that was quite a big deal you know there was a time when I had a serious relationship we had been together for five years lovely ex-boyfriend um and my granny pulled me aside I was quite young I was early 20s and she pulled me aside and she said you mustn't marry him until your older sister is married and settled you know like very traditional mindset and you know and I really hated all that as a teenager and then as I've grown and I've understood I think it's an interesting idea of being from another place and with parents and grandparents that project things on you and it's conflicted and it's hard. You know, I've grown mm. up in London. It's a very multicultural city. So I think the, the confidence of being able to use, to write a sentence you feel, like that. Sorry, do you feel like that sort of rejection of that culture allowed you to see it with fresh eyes or see it yeah. in a different way and maybe... Yeah, I, to... I think so. I, I think, because again, I was the only, and even now I was still the only one that left home. Like no one else from both sides of the grand, the second gen, the first, second generation grandkids from both sides of my family. No, 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 one, no one's left London. 
no one and London's incredible but London is very multicultural and if you are from immigrant families like you are in a lovely bubble like I left and I went to uni in Yorkshire that was probably I'd rejected the Greek school and all that stuff before then but it was going away and going to a different city in a different part of the country that is a real eye-opener you know I'm married now to an amazing man who's from the north of England and I love northerners but suddenly I was like oh hold on I'm more separate than I realized and I think because I shunned it and because I left and I did the backpacking and all these things that no one else really did I sort of have come to it I think slightly differently and and then as a result I'm now the opposite you know I'm fascinated in learning about cultures and people's heritage and my heritage and the sort of yeah all the influences and I I think that had a part in it yeah. but how, do, how does how does your family feel about you sort of taking up the mantle and representing and flying that flag. Really? Is this really... your redemption? <laughs> <laughs> they're like, oh, she's she's almost there. She's almost there. Yeah. Um, I think they're super proud. But my parents are quite um, quirky anyway. I wouldn't say they're typically separate. They are, you know, they're separate, but they're, they're quite quirky. And, um, and my granny, you know, my grandparents, before they passed away, the ones that passed away were all super proud. And my granny, who's still alive, is... You know, I showed her Greekish for the first time the other day, and she sat there. You know, she's a she's a serious woman, and she's in, she's an incredible woman. She's so stoic. She's eighty three. She still cooks for everyone all the time. You know, she cooks for all the family every week still, and she's super proud. Um, the thing that made me laugh though, she um, doesn't matter how much live telly I do, doesn't matter that I've got books or I write articles. She couldn't care less, right? But then one day she leaves me this voicemail and she's this granny speaks quite slang Cypriot Greek anyway. So sometimes I struggle to understand what she's on about. And I hate and I'm partially deaf. So I'm on the phone. She's left me this voice note and she's just screaming down the phone. I don't know what the hell she's on about. I'm on the school run running around. My mum comes around to help me with the kids. And I was like, oh, yeah, Yaz left me this voice note. I don't know what she's on about. When you chat to her, can you just tell her? I don't know what she's talking about. Anyway, it turns out she was watching Cypriot TV. She has satellite. And uh, and these two women on this cookery show referenced me from wow. Cyprus. And there's a recipe they were cooking on the show that was inspired by one of my recipes in Taverna. Well, yeah, yeah, I lost her mind. Everything else didn't matter. Someone yeah. on a Cypriot TV show said my name and spoke about it. She was, and honestly, it was the sweetest thing. Like, she's never been so proud. So anyway, long that's, story short, yeah, I think, I'm, I think I'm redeeming myself. You I'm think, getting you there. Know, you, you've been on sort of national TV in the UK, watched by millions probably, and this is like Doesn't matter. 13 people watching a <laughs> Cypriot station. This yeah. is what, so that finally, you've, you've, uh, you've managed to get a rise out of her. Yeah, yeah. yeah she was still for holy water on me yeah. and you know <laughs> sorry she'll still throw holy water on me and you know pray for my sins but you know i've made it so it's fine really really yeah well i think i think um you know peter redemption as well because he's the nicest person i'm sure that they're... oh but yeah they actually seeing pete and my granny together is so adorable like bless pete he's been doing duolingo greek for like three years really the, problem is the poor boy yeah He's been doing it for three years, right? He's doing really well with it, but also it's Greek from Greece. My family speaks Cypriot. And then my granny, the only one that's still alive, is it's not just Cypriot, it's very village Cypriot. So they don't really communicate, but they love each other so much. Their relationship is so adorable. I definitely think they all prefer him to me. So I think we're fine now. It's okay. Good. Good. He'll, basically, uh, he'll the eat girls that, are, they, are the girls doing Greek school? So, yeah, well, yes, Persephone was in Greek school. I think what we need now, Greek school wasn't quite right for her because I, we don't speak it at home, which is my fault, but we need a tutor. So I think the three of them need to learn together. So we're on the hunt, if anyone's out there, we're on the hunt for a tutor um, to come and teach them. But yeah, there's various music classes and things. So yeah, anyway, they're going to go to Cyprus for a month in the summer. They're going to just, they'll learn. They'll yeah, learn. Yeah. Go. This is this is your Greek school. The only way to learn, just chuck them in. Just go and speak to your cousins. Yeah, you'll figure I, out. I I wonder if you thought, you know, let's say you in your twenties, uh, that you thought, oh yeah, when I have kids, 
I'm going I will send them to Greek school and they will grow up on Greek food and we will be is it, are you surprised by that? I am surprised. Maybe not my twenties, but definitely in my teens. I I can't tell you the accuracy of that film, my big fat Greek wedding. That film is so unbelievably accurate for me from the fact that she grew up in this restaurant, she married a Xeni, a non-Greek person, she's got the glasses, she was like, you know. I, I'm so the ugly duckling, and I'm not saying I'm now a swan, but honestly, you should have seen me. I was such a tomboy. I never wore makeup. I had my glasses. I wore men's clothes. Like, I had no interest in my Greekness at all. And and then, you know, married this English boy and whatever. Like, I watched that film. I'm like, this is ridiculous. And then they, and the end of the film is they've got the house with the pillars, and they're all going to Greek school. And, I mean, it's me. It's me. I'm that mum now. I'm there. We, we should say to our fan viewers, turn this off now. Watch my fact, my Greek fact. Yeah. You don't need to know anymore. This is it. This is the story that, of Georgina Hayden. That film is brilliant, man. It's, it's so good. good. It's so hilarious. Good. Very good. Um, but no, what they can't see in the film is this wonderful book, which yes. I really, really want to talk about. I want to say, okay. and this is something that that you know, I've come to expect from your books, but also, but this one I think is what is, you know, next level is how beautiful it is. I mean, oh, so... Thank you. So beautifully photographed, so beautifully styled, so oh. appetizing. There's so many sort of beautiful visual moments mm -hmm. that I just adored. I loved seeing, I love the first picture of you reflecting in the window. I don't know what's happening there. Yeah. Uh, I love so Pete many. holding that tray of pork. <laughs> I love the little kebabs. Yes. Before and after. I'm saying, you know, I, you guys, you're going to get, you're going to have the book and you're going to have so much visual joy from it. These are just little oh. references. Thank you. Um, yeah, the visuals really, I mean, that's the thing. That's where the art background comes in. It's really important. And the team that I shoot with, I adore. And I think you do get that with a book. Like, you know, I know you shoot with the same people as well. Like when you've gotten to know someone, it's not a, like a job. I've done, I've worked on lots of people's books over the years and I've worked on stuff and, you know, amazing. But when you've got a rapport with someone, yeah. it's, you know, it, the shots are just different. You know, it's it's part of family. So Laura, I, I'm lucky to work with two photographers. So Laura, who shot Greekish, shot Staring Slowly. And it's just very informal. Like those shots, the portraits where I'm walking or I'm outside a bakery, like the, they were just snippets in time. And, yeah. you know, to feel that comfortable. But also we shot it in my garden, a lot of it. A lot of it was quite chaotic. You know, we had everything. There was always Greek music playing really loud. Weirdly, the sun was always shining, you know, and... Yeah, you know, like that little subchapter, Things on Sticks. You know, that was the working title. I was like, no, it should just be Things on Sticks, you know. And I was like, I want a, a before and an after of all the different skewers, you know, and the marinades, just really graphic. Um, but yeah, it's really visual. And I think because it's what I would say, and this almost sounds neg like a negative thing, but I, it's not, it's my most commercial book, I would say. Um, is the book that I think is the most accessible that people can cook from after work or when they're really busy or they've got kids. It's quite an easy, straightforward book um, in a way that Nistissima was probably more like deep and challenging. This is much more, you know, every day. And I wanted yeah. the photography to reflect that. I didn't want it to be too complex. I wanted it to be like, oh, that looks nice. I'll make it, you know, like... Yeah. You don't have to think too hard. So yeah, I mean, this is what uh what I will say, and this is kind of like really annoying as as someone who writes cookbooks, but it's just uh I I'm flicking through it and I was like, yeah, I'm gonna cook that. <laughs> wanna cook that. Which is what you want. You want people yeah. to say you want people to sort of earmark what they're gonna cook. Yeah. And I was just like every single page, and I said <laughs> This is really annoying, actually. <laughs> I, I hope you know. I hope you know that. I mean, this is the best compliment I can give. It is, and thank you. <laughs> thank I'm annoyed you. by a cookbook because it's just so sort of cookable, and you just want to eat everything. I love that word, cookable. That's exact. That's like that's wicked. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, that's what yeah. you hope for, I isn't it? And don't I think, think yeah. it's a real word, but I think it is now. 
It's, it is now. Cookable. It is now. You've made that's, it to read. That's world. your next book or my next book. That's a great book title. We should we should yeah, cut yeah. this out so no one else steals it. Um, yeah, and that's the thing. Like, I did want to write a book that was a bit more straightforward, but in a in a cookable, accessible way. And I and I hope because you know it's Greek. It's called Greek ish. It's Greek ish. They're not no. traditional recipes, and you know they're well, more. Very, it feels very contemporary. It feels very mm. sort of. Yeah. Uh, our real lives. This yeah. Time. This, this is, is it. Like the one of the recipes that I think sums the book up the most and was one of the first recipes I wrote was the um, the one pan pasticcio. So pasticcio. I knew you, know, you were going to say that. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I think so many people are going to cook that. I know yeah, I am. But... Because there you go. That's so basically for anyone that doesn't yeah. know, pasticcio is a greek to really be really you know basic about it it's like a greek lasagna you've got layers of pasta you've got the ragu you've got the bechamel and traditionally it's the kind of thing that would take hours and several pans you know it's the kind of thing you make on a weekend it's not a weeknight thing and i remember when i first started the book i was like i want recipes that people can cook after work um but are as you know kind of traditional so this one is all done in one pan you make the ragu you make it really wet so that you cook the pasta in it and then for the white sauce it's just creme fraiche with egg yolks and lots of cheese you spoon it over the top and then you pop it under the grill so you haven't got loads of washing up it does become this thing you can do after work it's all kid family friendly and that to me was like almost the, one of the first recipes I wrote and it was almost a benchmark of how yeah. the book should feel you know so yeah. yeah yeah I like that one I could this is what I was saying I was I could totally I was just like I know exactly what which pan I'm going to use and I know exactly <laughs> you know what I mean it just, I love it just sort of slotted right into my yeah. my <laughs> kitchen and my life and I love that oh, there were so many God. recipes there were so many recipes like that for me another another Stand up, which I think so many people are going to cook, is the chicken rice. Oh, yeah. It, yeah. It just sounds just, perfect. Yeah. That was, again, that was like, we had so much, I had so much fun. Fu I just had so much fun with the recipes, you know, and that came about after development day with like my right hand woman, Holly, who is, you know, in the kitchen. She's the person that I like to bounce off. And we have these like mad creative days sometimes. And it was the idea of like having this classic Greek style marinade with your oregano and your garlic and all those lovely lemony olive oil flavors, simple, but familiar, delicious flavors. And then it was like, well, we want it on chicken wings, really nigh chicken wings, but I also want it on chicken thighs. And I want those juices to go into the rice. So we were like, let's just do both. You know, so yeah. it's like this chicken two ways. So you can do it with this feta dip and then these wings. And then, you know, Pete basically ate the entire serving of four in one sitting or and the, but then it becomes yeah. <laughs> yeah he was like how many am I meant to eat of these I was like I mean you should have probably stopped but whatever <laughs> and then you know but you then do. also you know how that like chicken just the juices and then but also it's this one pan thing right so anyway yeah it's just having fun with them and and, and yeah. basically cooking things that I really really just wanted to eat yeah. you know and this is what another thing that I really enjoyed about the book is is kind of like, yeah, if I you know I have these two delicious things, both are going. You know, yeah. it's not it's not an either or. Yeah. I don't mind if I need to do two lemon chicken. There will be two lemon chicken. <laughs> delicious. You should cook the both of them, and we will. I yes. will. Yeah. Oh, thanks. And there's thanks. there's a lot of there's a lot of that in the book. There's a little yeah. sort of uh, spanakopita yes. episode, which I <laughs> loved as well. There's a lot of playfulness. I, you know, yeah. when I first start, I don't know how your process is, but when I first start thinking about the book writing process, you know, like if you ask a lot of authors, I'm sure they would say the same. Like the thing, when I first get to the initial idea of a book from the end result, it changes a lot right over the, yeah. along the way. Some of the recipes don't make it or whatever. But I, one of the things that I do kind of set in stone quite early on is the chapters. And then, and that's sort of, I, I'll vaguely do my chapters. So this one, for example, it's breakfasts. Um, yeah. Then it's small bites. So, cause obviously, you know, we love a meze. So it's things like snacky bits and dips and stuff. Then it was the weeknight chapter, which was, um, and it is the biggest chapter. It's the accessible chapter. Yeah. Then- It's like it, the heart of the, the book. Yeah, yeah, it's the, yeah. It's the heftiest. 
Then it was low, the low and slow chapter. So like your weekend dishes, sides, always important. I love the sides, always love sides. And then it was sweet stuff. But so that was kind of the initial structure. But then as I was writing it and I'm having all this fun, I was like, well, I want a little sub chapter just on cheese or a section. I want a little section just on Spanakopita because I bloom in love Spanakopita. I want a little sub chapter on a subsection on baklava because I just want everything to taste like baklava. And then then came the things on sticks as well, because when I was writing things on sticks, the idea was you choose your protein and then these are the best marinades for that if you're doing a barbecue. Really easy, really quick. And I was like, well, it could go in the weeknight, but sod it. I want it to be its own little chapter. So I created the sort of structure and then within it, I liked having these playful moments of, um, yeah. I mean, the baklava, the dedication to baklava could have just gone on and on. Yeah. And, on. <laughs> yeah. and I mean the cheesecake looks the baklava cheesecake yeah good. it's honestly like I know it's not the I'm the first person in the world to ever do baklava cheesecake but I'm so proud of that recipe and that is one of the very few recipes or things in my life where I left my AI speechless so I made it last Easter last year and uh so there was Cypria TV and then the cheesecake as well yeah she just so this, like, honestly, trust me, my Aya, she will tell me, right? And uh, she just, I didn't big it up. I didn't hype it up. I said, look, this is a cheesecake bucket, blah, blah, blah. I gave it to her. And she's eating it. And she's just, like, looking at me. And she's quite an intense woman. She's staring at me. And she's just, like, shaking her head. She's, like, as in, like, I've got nothing. i got nothing. And I was, like, done. I peaked. Um, yeah, I'm done. I'm out. I finished. Yeah. <laughs> My exactly drop my i'm now i'm walking out so yeah that was uh she's really invested i'll tell you which one she's really and i've made these for you actually i need to, i need you to get i need to get them to you asap um she was really invested in the feta cookies because that oh, recipe yeah, these look amazing well i i don't know if you do this i got it in my head that i i'd read somewhere about someone doing a chocolate like a dark chocolate style cookie with feta whatever and so I'd got, and it was an American publication. And I'd gone on this little journey and I was like, well, well, I put feta in my baklava anyway. So, and then what if I made it into a cookie? Anyway, so I went on this thing and I, I became obsessed with these blooming cookies. I cannot tell you how many versions, like until I, it was exactly how I wanted it to taste. And she was invested, man, because she was there for like version three or four. And she was like, I think you should do this. And I think, you should, and I was like, yeah, anyway. She was very invested, and then she got the final sign off. <laughs> really? Yeah. I mean, this this is a, another recipe that I I, th I thought this just makes so much sense. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like nobody thought about it, but it just makes so much sense. And this yeah. is, I think, a lot of a lot of these sort of recipes or ideas or or stuff in the book, they just feel like they've always been there. Oh, I love they that. Should have always been there, but haven't. Oh, and this I think is kind of like, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's like a massive compliment. I mean, you know, that is such a compliment, and that's yeah, yeah. Is, the, I mean it as as such because it's kind of like thank you. It's kind of like between that's great and why didn't I think of it? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you are the man who has got the best, you know, feta mm. cheesecake in the world. Yeah. But there is, yeah, the feta cookies. I'm, yeah, I'm really. I am proud of them. And there are things, you know, there's lovely classic recipes that I sort of hope become part of people's repertoire. And then there are things that, you know, I just, I don't want them to be seen as faddy. You know, that, that cookie recipe is not in it because it's a faddy idea. You know, the salty sweet idea is not a new one. Like it just works, mm. you know, it does work. And we've, you know, even we use cheese and sweet stuff all the time. So we've got a sweet thing called burekia and basically they're like, Almost, they look just like ravioli. So imagine ravioli, but inside is anari, which is like a ricotta, sugar, ricotta, rose water, and cinnamon. And you mix it and then you stuff these um, raviolis and then you deep fry them and you serve them hot mm -hmm. with icing sugar, right? So the idea of cheese and sweet isn't something, it's not new for us. Um, so it's not, I'm not, I never want to just create something for it to be gimmicky. You know, it has to be yeah. good enough. You know, so yeah, I hope that's hope that you know people feel the same. So that's yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm sure 
I'm sure they will. I mean, it's I really think. sort of, it's a very, very open, very, very oh. generous as well. Oh, thanks, love. And this is another thing that I like, you know, that you said, you know, I'm not holding, it felt to me like you're not holding anything back. And you say, yeah. I worked on this. I love this and this and this. Have all of it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm leaving nothing back. Yeah. This is all for you. And, and it's just kind of like that feeling for me was very sort of welcoming and very Georgie. Oh, thanks, really, love. That's really, so lovely. That's such a beautiful thing to hear. And like, yeah, I, it is. That's but that's like, and you're the same. Food is my love language. You yeah. know, it's your love language. Like, yeah. I, I'm a, if I if I care about you, and I, I probably do because I've got you know a lot of love to give. Like, I'm gonna feed you, and that's that's the reality. That's how you show you care. How I show I care. That's you know, and and the same as for the books, right? Like, there's no need to hold stuff back, and and I just want to just yeah I want to give that joy you know I mean I don't know about you but I find like doesn't matter how many recipes I write or how how far I go into this career like if people are when someone said to me I've made your recipe and, and my family loved it and it's part of it I like that that is like I'm done that's made yeah. my day it's yeah. made my day yeah you know what else can you ask for yeah I love especially you know now, and I'm sure that you're the same. That we we have been doing it for for a few years now. Yeah. And, and uh, I have I have people, you know, not people, but I have, you know, we, we've been writing for the Financial Times for twenty yeah. years, for ten years. Wow. Twenty year old saying, you know, I grew up on your food. My mom, oh. you know, would would. I was like, wow, that's that's, mad. that's amazing. It's, your it's food. It's a huge privilege. It's going to be. And this is something that actually I've written about and I am really conscious of as well. And um, the book's dedicated to my girls. But, you know, your food is going to be people's nostalgia. You know, yeah. that's such a big deal. And that's, it, it's such, whether you're a food person or not, right, people always talk about what's your death row meal? What's your dinner party meal? What yeah. is the thing when you're poorly and you want a hug, what is it you think? And everyone always says the same. It's always my mum's this, like my mum's yeah. that. I honestly think that's also why people in this country love roast dinners because as a foreigner or someone who's not from like my, you know my heritage is from here I don't really love a roast dinner I find them normally quite disappointing but I think it's the nostalgia for most people yeah. right and your recipes that you've written are someone's nostalgia and and that's kind of like the book is dedicated to the girls you know they are I mean the name Greekish is relevant on lots of levels it's the food it's my background it's everything it's like hit so many marks but yeah. it's also my children my girls are greekish they are half greek half english you know and that's not why i named it but they are and it's dedicated to them and you know they are lucky in that they've got this mum who cooks all the time and they're exposed to all these different cuisines but i want them to have food that is their nostalgia that is their memories that when they grow up they'll be like oh yeah mum made that every fortnight or you know whatever like it's it's a it's a really big deal to be part of someone's food yeah. upbringing. I think you know. So do you think they're going to grow up to be sort of McDonald fiends before the they come back to Mama's food? Do you know what, babe? Oh my god, I I did it really wrong with Persephone. I was so like, no TV, no sugar. As a result, this child has got the best palate. We've just been to Thailand. She will eat anything. Like she's she's me. Persephone is me. She's got no filter. She doesn't matter if something's bright red because it's laced with chili. She wants to try it, right? Which is fantastic. But because I did also deprive her quite a lot of the things that I thought worked good, she's completely obsessed, right? She doesn't then have the got... defense. Yeah. Right. If someone has a packet of sweets, you better believe that child is like a shotgun. She's like, she's like, where is it? I want it. You know, she it, it's like it's mad. If there's a TV on somewhere in someone's house. She's like that, you know, because she was deprived. Then yeah. you've got a lecture, classic second child, just gets scraps, remnants, whatever. Her, her first, she was probably weaned on Haribo, do you know what I mean? She's just less <laughs> fussed. She's like, whatever, you know, it's not yeah. as big a deal. So anyway, we'll see. They're, listen, they're good kids. They're good eaters. We do our best. I was raised in the 80s, even though we had a restaurant, you know, there was always, you know, we all turned out fine, you know? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. As long as someone said to me, the best bit of advice someone said to me, my friend who's a nutritionist, she said, 
if your kids see you eating well, they will get there. And I just yeah. think that's the best, you know. Yeah, they'll go they'll go on a little journey, they'll try other things, yeah. but they have a good sort of yeah. yeah. Hope so. And cooking? Are they cooking with you? Yeah, they do actually. Persephone is much more interested than Electra, but they are. They've got their own knives, they've got their own equipment. Um, Electra helped me in the kitchen yesterday because I had to make a hundred of these feta cookies. So um yeah, they are interested, you know, and I get them involved. We planted some kale seeds and some sweet Swiss chard, and you know, they're they're into it. They are. I think, you know, I take them shopping and I get them to choose what they want for dinner as well. So then they're invested. And it's boring, like all parents will know this and then they roll their eyes because it's effort. But you know, if they help me cook something, they're more likely to eat it. That is just mm -hmm. the reality, you know. But who's always got the time? But yeah, they are. And actually, but isn't it, it's funny, you said that earlier about the restaurant. I don't necessarily want them to go into food. So Persephone's at the age now, she's almost seven. She's like, I want to be a cooker like you. That's what she calls me. I want to be a cooker like you. I'm like, I don't want you to be a cooker, babe. <laughs> anyway, well, there, I don't there know there is, one. yeah. Yeah. A cooker. We're cookers. Uh, I mean, it is um I don't know if it's, we should say it is we do have the the doing these books and, and writing the recipes, it's it's a it's a fun job, but is it it's, don't know how much of a profession it is. You know? I well, exactly. Yeah, it's all the other stuff. I mean, you've got the restaurants, you know how hard work is. Yeah. You know, I've come from doing food TV for 12 years like it's hard it's not easy but yeah. listen she can do what as long as they're happy i don't care but i'm definitely not pushing them yeah to be a because, cooker yeah to be a cooker <laughs> i love that uh do they have a favorite recipe from the book oh good question um they love the one pan bested sure they really love i tell you which recipe they love and it's also one of my favorites is um the Uvetsi, so it's from the low and slow chapter um and it's using uh beef short rib and it's a yeah. really simple recipe but it's just my version of it and i do think it's actually quite stand out it's beef short rib that's just really slowly cooked with all your classic base onions celery you know all that stuff garlic carrots and then red wine and then you stir orzo and you yeah. carry on cooking it in the oven with the orzo and it's just one of those dishes that is just so um, deeply comforting and yeah. incredible and because all the flavors just contained and then you're just like and then we grate loads of halloumi over the top so that's yeah that's a theme they... in the book i have to say <laughs> when in doubt great halloumi well it was almost called that <laughs> a grating of halloumi just add feta or halloumi um yeah. i had to do a cheese subject chapter didn't i really it had to happen but yeah that's i think that's one of their favorites they eat that a lot which is, you know, that's good. I'm yeah, happy with that. Amazing. Lucky yeah. them. Yeah, they're all right. They they listen, they're fine. They're allowed yeah. at McDonald's once in a while as well. I'm not I'm not a complete horrible mother. Yeah. You yeah. Know? I mean, I think uh it's like you said, one you, you you experiment on the first one and then the second one you're just like Dra yeah, dragged up. I'm the second kid, you know? We turned yeah. I turned out right, we turn out fine. It's not the end of the world. <laughs> uh which does bring me to the the sort of the the second best quote of the book oh uh from your sister lulu oh did you apricot and orange blossom which i was i thought was so beautiful oh bless it's you oh so, you know there's such like sisterly love in that sentence because it does it is you you are that you know <laughs> I thought it was so beautiful. That's so sweet. Yeah, that's so true. She did. She said to me, she's like, well, you are. Like, I live off apricot jam with halloumi. It's like my favourite thing in the world. If that's my comfort food, if I've got all else fails and I can't, haven't got anything in the bank to like do anything decent in life, I'll have a halloumi and apricot jam sandwich. And, I, you know, that was always me growing up. Orange blossom and, and apricot jam and apricot, like just my favourite. And, you know, I've got a tiny little London garden and one of the first things I did was plant an apricot tree. You know, and it's good. It yields. Good. I get through. It's brilliant. It's you know, we get eight like sweet? that big. Yeah. What? Yeah. Oh my god, you've got to come over. It's got at the moment. It's got about forty. So it's my biggest year yet. It's only four years old. This little tree, and and I love it. And of course, I planted an apricot tree. You know, that was just I had to. And yeah, yeah like yeah. If I was a smell, that would be it. Apricot, apricots and orange blossom. But yeah, yeah. bless Lulu. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's your your sort of. Your sunny soul. I, I, when I was reading that, I was just like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, 
thanks man i love that yeah i love that and this is uh kind of we probably need to wrap up but this yeah was kind of like a big a big big part of the charm of this book is this this sort of um family life and home life revolves around this sort of delicious sunny you know sort of soul nourishing food yeah uh, and and the sort of generosity of you Aww. kind of like bringing us into your kitchen and coming into our kitchens and talking too loud and just ticking <laughs> I, I just oh so thank you so much thank you oh no thank you my love thank you for getting it for you know just, i love chatting with you it's just been brilliant so thank you yeah, yeah i think we just get rid of the crowd and then we can continue yeah, everyone, yeah we're done. we'll just carry blow on blow. i'm literally just gonna come over in a second i'll bring you the cookies i'll see you in five good <laughs> thanks so much Tamar. pleasure darling big love Bye.